If we only looked at the data and quantified things based on frequency, we would be working on lateness every single day and we would maybe not focus as much on things like orders that aren't delivered. But of course, that's not the way things work. And when you look at the long-term consumer experience, an order not being delivered is so much worse for churn and just for long-term consumer engagement. And so if you quantify the different parts of your business, not just based on frequency, but also based on impact, then you can use that information to actually make the right trade-off and to prioritize the right work streams internally. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Who's hungry? Thanks to delivery apps like DoorDash, it's never been easier for modern consumers to satisfy almost any craving in just a few taps. At the helm of DoorDash's data organization is VP of Analytics and Data Science, Jessica Lax. Her challenge? To seamlessly operate at the complex intersection of our online and offline worlds, balance the interests of dashers, businesses, and consumers, and make the right trade-offs to keep customers happy. Tune into this episode to learn how she weighs these trade-offs, how she collects data to create a 360-degree view of what's happening on the platform, and what striking the right balance between privacy and personalization looks like. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people at companies like Verizon, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Frontify, Hari, and Workato use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Jess, welcome to The Data Chief. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so where are you joining us from today? I am in Austin, Texas currently. Okay, Austin, Texas. Um, but the company DoorDash, founded in Palo Alto originally, I feel like I yes. should start by asking you, what, what have you ordered from DoorDash today? <laughs> So I actually ordered lunch from DoorDash today. Uh, I was a bit tight and couldn't couldn't put something together. So I ordered uh, a salad from Sweetgreen uh, to be delivered, which is a pretty frequent order for me. Okay, great. And I guess you have all the data on what we're eating and drinking and our favorite restaurants. Is there something fun that you can share with us about some of these trends so i think the funny thing is i think i'm actually very much on trend which is consistency we've seen time and time again that the most commonly ordered foods remain the most commonly ordered foods year after year i think it will come as no surprise to anyone that french fries are the top menu item uh, ordered every year i think since we've been tracking this or since i've been looking at it uh, and, and consistency, we're seeing consistency not just in the items that people are ordering and the cuisines that are popular, but just with ordering behaviors in general. So um, we had run uh, several surveys during COVID and post COVID that uh, ordering delivery continues to be a consumer preference. And um, most consumers are ordering the same this year that they did that they did last year. And so um, I think that's uh, definitely shown in my own personal life, um, an N of one, but uh, we're seeing that across the board. And there actually was one fun trend that stuck out. Um, I think this was in a report we did last year on snacking trends, but we saw a huge increase in the sale of hot chili pepper and lime tortilla chips. So just like the general like hot and spicy snacks. So not a personal preference, but definitely something that we're seeing an increase in from, from consumers and how they're snacking. Oh, so interesting. Well, mine is probably dessert, but <laughs> which is not necessarily <laughs> a good thing, but um, I don't know that. So thank you for sharing Absolutely that. Absolutely <laughs> a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> so if I look back at, um, you know, one of the original visions when DoorDash was first launched. It was really using artificial intelligence, AI, to perfect delivery 
um, taking into every variant and, and your variants have actually gotten more complex over time because now it's not just restaurants, it's also um, convenience stores, whether it's the Quick Check near me or the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, how, how does data and analytics power all of this? I mean, we are an insanely data-driven company. We collect data everywhere we can. We try and measure everything and use that data to inform the decisions that we're making. And so, you know, I think that we have a philosophy that by quantifying everything that we that we do, we can make better decisions more quickly. We can evaluate the trade-offs that we're that we are making and quantify the impact of those decisions. So, for example, if you if we had a hundred dollars to spend, would it be better to spend that hundred dollars to lower delivery times for consumers? Would it be better to spend that hundred dollars to acquire a new consumer? Would it be a better use of the hundred dollars to offer a discount to existing consumers? We're able to quantify all of those different trade-offs across the platform to really understand the levers of our business. And that helps us to make good investment decisions, to measure the ROI, and to do that really, really quickly. And as we all know, speed is is really important in, in operating a successful business. So that's a lot of data, and trade-offs are hard. Um, so mm-hmm. ha- how do you how do you work with your stakeholders to balance those trade-offs? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's about once you've understood the different levers, then you have to under, then you have to make a decision that maximizes the impact for your different customer segments. So, for example, we we talk a bit internally about defects, so issues that might go wrong on a delivery. Hopefully, you've never encountered this experience, but there are things that can go wrong on a delivery, and so if we're focused on quantifying uh, internal defects. Defects. That might be something like a customer who never receives their order. We call that never delivered. Uh, it might be a missing item. It might be an order that's delivered late. Those are all things that we consider defects. Now, we've quantified the impact of defects on long-term consumer engagement. If you only looked at the frequency of defects, you would see that an order being five minutes late happens more frequently than an order not being delivered. But an order not being delivered is a much worse consumer experience. Um, if you never get your food, right, that's, there's nothing to eat. If you get your food three or four minutes late, you actually may not even notice. And so if we only looked at the data and quantified things based on frequency, we would be working on lateness every single day and we would maybe not focus as much on things like orders that aren't delivered. But of course, that's not that's not the way things work. Uh, and when you look at the long-term consumer experience, an order not being delivered is, is so much worse for churn, for, and just for long-term consumer engagement. And so if you quantify the, the different parts of your business, not just based on frequency, but also based on impact, then you can use that information to actually make the right trade-off and to prioritize the right work streams internally. Uh, and it makes it a lot clearer on how you are gonna trade off, how you're gonna resource things, how you're gonna spend your money, because it's a clear, consistent, decision framework that you're using to make these business decisions. And so in this case, we know that never delivered is a really bad experience. We focus on trying to reduce the frequency to zero for never delivered. And we've also elevated some of these key defects internally so that as we ship new product features, as we make changes to the algorithms of our business, we're always looking to ensure that it's not having this you know, unintended consequence and increasing uh, some of these some of these defects for consumers. Yeah, and so never delivered. I mean, I use DoorDash most often when I'm traveling. So arriving late at a hotel, um, for example. So not delivered means no dinner usually, or or terrible snacks just from whatever's in the kiosk in the <laughs> hotel lobby, um, which is probably not a good substitute. No. But um, have not experienced that. You'll be pleased to know. But as I think Great. as I think about this complex journey 
of matching really drivers or dashers and then um, what is available at the restaurant or the convenience store, what have you, um, inventory that you don't necessarily control and your merchants, it's such a complicated supply chain. And then mm -hmm. overlay of late, we've had um, some crazy weather events. So take, take us through how you pull all these disparate data sources together to ultimately delight the customers. Yeah, so you just talked about some of the really fun, in my opinion, complexities of a marketplace business that really combines the online world and the offline world. We've, we're sort of at the intersection of all of those areas and that added complexity for someone who's sort of a, a data nerd like myself just <laughs> makes things interesting. It keeps, keeps you on your toes. Uh, and so for us, it's really about collecting as much information as we can about all sides of the marketplace, bringing all of that data together into a central uh, data platform where all of that data is accessible no matter the source, whether it's coming from um, our production systems, transactional data, whether it's event data in our apps, uh, whether that's the consumer app, the Dasher app, the merchant app, uh, whether it's coming from our CRM systems, all of that data needs to come into one central place so that we can tie it together and use the insights together to create a 360 degree picture of what's happening on our platform and off our platform so that we can use that information not just to provide accurate menus and, and inventory for consumers, but also so we can send the right email communications to, to, to consumers, to dashers, so that we really have a full picture of what's happening and can use that for personalization and to, to help all three sides of our marketplace really optimize at their, at their peak efficiency. Yeah, so as you dive into that personalization, this is where privacy comes in to play. Where are the drivers? Um, where am I? And what, I'm, what am I eating in particular? Or maybe it's the expensive dinner I ordered <laughs> while traveling or something. Um, how do you ins how do you provide that personalization? If you ordered from, for me, for example, from Sweetgreen, Next time you come to the platform, wouldn't it be helpful if we said, hey, do you want to reorder this order from Sweetgreen? We already have all of your preferences stored and saved to make it easy for you to reorder. And so it's things like that where you can really use this information and the, 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 the data that we have on different behaviors to reduce friction and streamline the ordering experience. So it's all in, um, it's all to attempt to make things better for, for consumers, for dashers, uh, and, and for merchants, and, and make things a little bit easier because we're all about convenience. Everybody loves convenience and speed. Yeah, and so it sounds like as long as it's benefiting either the restaurant trying to get the food to the customers or the customers receiving the food, as long as there's a benefit to them, then the personalization is good. Um, it's not it's not then about selling the data um, for others to leverage. No, I mean, I think you know, we see we talked earlier about a uh, Reese Food Trends report that we put together. So in aggregate, we'll look at trends overall. We'll look at popular merchants, frequently ordered items, but it's all aggregated um, and it's all to, to understand sort of over overall marketplace dynamics and and helping to share that information with um, with merchants on our platform so that they can improve their menus and improve their restaurant offerings. And so that's a lot, a little bit about how we use the data on the platform to sort of help the different audiences that we have um, as an overall trend and, and set of themes to, to, help, to help them to generate more sales on the platform and to, and, and to help consumers figure out 
what's good to order? You mentioned you use um, DoorDash quite a bit when you travel. You might not be familiar with that city. And so how can we surface things like ratings and reviews and most popular in your area and most loved in your area? How can we use the information from the platform that we've collected from others around you to help you who may be less familiar with the, with the selection in your geography to really understand what's great? What are you going to love? And so those are just some of the ways that we use the data um, to to improve the experience for, for all three sides of our marketplace. Yeah, so it does sound like the data usage, it, it was clear to me how it benefits me as a consumer, but for the merchants, is it about um, maximizing their their revenues or is it also, does it even go as far as like staffing efficiencies or minimizing spoilage? Yes, yeah, so I think you know, data has the ability to improve all parts of our business. So we talked a little about using food trends to help merchants to identify new items that maybe they want to consider adding to their menu. We also use data to understand how menu structures, uh, including the different uh, types of um, menu sections they have, appetizers, entrees, top items, can, can help to improve menu conversion. We've also done studies that show that adding food photos can really help to improve conversion for restaurants on menus. I mean, how many times have you been sitting there, you're hungry and you see a slice, a, like a juicy slice of pizza and you're just like, oh, I wanna eat that, right? Food and photographs of food, incredibly enticing. And so how can we use these insights to help to, to surface these tips and tricks for merchants to really um, maximize user conversion on their menus. You also mentioned staffing and day parts. How can we surface ordering trends by day part for merchants to say, hey, we're seeing a really big influx of traffic and conversion at this time of day. It would be, and we're seeing that wait times in the restaurant are higher than they are at other times of the day. What can we do to improve that? How can we streamline your menu? How can we staff up in store? What are the different things that we can do to really improve merchant operations in store, uh, as well as on our platform? Again, all in the service of generating more sales for merchants. Yeah, and so I'm picturing, uh, Jessica, you described a mouthwatering pizza, and I'm, I'll be curious if the data will show when we release this podcast, the orders that go up for pizza. <laughs> From DoorDash. I don't at that think time. it's possible. I think I've got <laughs> I've got all the pizza orders already on my account. <laughs> um, so the other thing you mentioned is bringing all this data together in a centralized place, and how organizations architect their data platforms, whether it's if you want to call it a data lake, a data warehouse, and increasingly we talk about the data mesh or a data fabric. I know that your engineering team recently went through a major refactoring to more microservices oriented. Tell us a little bit um, about that, how, how the data team decides the right data model and architecture and how you collaborate with the infrastructure or engineering team to make that happen? So for us, we want data to be easily accessible to all the different teams that need access to it. Uh, analytics being one of the, the largest customers of data at, at DoorDash, of course. But um, the way that we think about our data models is really about increasing accessibility and consistency to, to that data. So having all of our data in one central place and making sure that it is high, it's performant. Uh, and so like query speeds are fast, uh, that data models are thoughtful so that it makes it a lot easier for data scientists, analysts, operators, product managers to be able to query the data that's needed and use the data in our production in our, in our production systems as well. And so we try to be thoughtful about how we structure our data models and how we ensure that all of the different um, different production systems tie together into that central, as you mentioned, that central data lake. 
The other thing that we always want to ensure, and, and a big part of what we do on analytics, is to ensure that as we're going through my different migrations, as we're making these infrastructure changes, that we're ensuring that there's no data loss, and we're making sure that the that all of the data we're collecting it continues to be accurate uh, and complete. And so complete like data governance overall and checking to make sure that you know the changes we make don't disrupt the data flows is one one of the areas that the analytics team will work closely with our engineering to, uh, team to to be able to not just ensure it's being done in a healthy way but also a lot of these migrations and infrastructure changes are to improve speed or reliability and so we also want to quantify those things um, we don't just quantify the the efficacy of new models or product features. We also want to know how does app speed and reliability result in a better experience for consumers and for dashers. And so to the to the theme that we've been talking quite a bit about, about kind of measuring everything, that's just one other area where, where analytics can really help to uh, help our engineering team to quantify the impact of the changes that they're making uh, and really ensure that they feel like these changes are adding value to the business because we are all in service of driving towards business impact. Right. And so you also mentioned accuracy in that. And mm -hmm. the, ch the challenge here, there's no such thing as perfect data. And I think probably what is maybe harder for DoorDash um, in your business model, you don't necessarily have control over some of that data, the cleanliness, as you have expanded to retailers, what is really their inventory? Um, and so it's been fascinating digging into how you fill in those data gaps when you don't own the data. Um, every outlet has a different format. Product level data is hard. Can you describe a little bit more about that? So I think there's I, there's sort of two parts to this. One is sometimes you don't need perfect or complete data to still make a great decision. And I think it's really part of our job from an analytics team is to determine when a quick decision with maybe 60% confidence is actually the right decision to make for speed of execution and because we believe it's directionally the right way and the decision's the right one versus when we need better or more, more, um, more perfect data, when we need to spend time to get more precision with that answer. And knowing the balance between those um, like high confidence, high accuracy decisions versus maybe less confident, less accurate decisions is part of my responsibility uh, and, and to help the business move as quickly as possible while making sure we don't make the wrong decision. I'd say the other part is that that's where creativity comes into play because there are ways where you can fill in the data based on, well, there's statistical techniques that you can use, but there's also, you know, can you look at a subset of the data and use that to make a generalization about the broader population that maybe is incomplete? And I think that that's one of the areas where my team excels, which is getting creative to get to solutions that are better than kind of throwing your hands up in the air and saying, I can't do this. I can't make a decision because I don't have all the information. So I really look for people who have that creativity of of, of approach uh, who and and can ultimately get an answer that's better than no answer. For the, for the team. Yeah, so you mentioned the creativity and maybe using predictive analytics, and I think this was one of the things that fascinated me, that it just didn't occur to me. The way sometimes when you don't know the inventory, you're actually using predictive analytics and then bringing in photos from the dashers who were there, um, whereas my my process flow mind was thinking, no, get get the inventory from that retailer, <laughs> load it into your system rather than applying this. So I think that's a fascinating workflow. Um, you mentioned creativity as part of your team. The other thing that I uh, saw that your team values is the communication skills. And 
we have recognized as an industry that communication skills actually is a gap in many of the data scientists coming into the market and many of the business analytics and data science university programs. So how have you actually recruited for these skills or um, build these skills within your team? I think, you know, it's throughout the interview process, there are certain soft skills that we really look for. Of course, we need people who meet a technical bar, who have the the skill set to be able to answer the problems that we are facing, you know, every day. Uh, that's table stakes. But what makes someone great within DoorDash Analytics uh, is someone who can communicate well with stakeholders, both technical and non-technical. Someone who we talked about creativity of problem solving, uh, someone who is resilient, so handles change well and actually gets energized by change. Um, I like to look for people who aren't wedded to a particular outcome or a particular solution, but really want to use the data to understand what is the next step that we should take based on what we're seeing. How do we use the information we're collecting to iterate, to uncover new opportunities? Uh, I don't like using data to just confirm what we already believe. So I think that finding people who are are resilient, who like change and who like the data to lead ch to change is really important. Um, and then to the to the communication piece that that you mentioned, we work across product engineering, operations, marketing, legal, right? All across the company as a central analytics organization. So it's really important that you that the data scientists be able to communicate the, the key takeaways, what we call the TLDR, the too long didn't read, um, the TLDR of any analysis and share the, what's the so what? What's the important thing that we learn and then what should we do about it? And that that's actually the most important thing for driving business impact because everyone's gonna assume that the work is right, that the work has been done, the analysis is sound. That's for us internally to peer review and to ensure what our stakeholders and our business partners care about is the what's the takeaway and what do we do about it? And how do we use this? Um, how do we empower ourselves to make better decisions because we now know this information? And so looking for people who have some of those soft skills, maybe is, you know, um, the, those characteristics in addition to the, the technical uh, expertise that we look for is, is really important and why you know, I'm constantly impressed by the talent of the team and, and the impact that they're driving. Yeah, I loved the blog from, uh, uh, I think it was James and Lokesh on TLDR. <laughs> so we'll include that <laughs> in, the, um, in the show notes. But you also talked about resiliency and there is in the pandemic now, I think it's, it's a combination of pandemic, digital transformation, accelerated pace of change that organizations are recognizing that resiliency and adaptability is one of the new must-have skills. Yeah, so I joined as our first GM and we didn't have any markets for a GM or a general manager to run because we were we were still in launch mode. So I helped to launch some of our earliest markets. Wow. So um, and and I think about as a GM, the diversity of skills that you just described needing in, in this environment and in analytics in general. I'm thinking about your own unique background from Gift Simple, a startup you co-founded and launched and your time at Lehman Brothers. Tell us how that has shaped your journey to DoorDash and the impact that you're having there? Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about resilience. Um, and I think I had to learn resilience when uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. I, I am generally a risk averse person. You might not think it based on my career, but I no. swear I am. <laughs> um, and the thing was, I was working in investment banking. It's what my father had done. I was It was what I wanted to do when I went to college and I was doing it. And I thought, you know, safe career. And then the financial crisis, 2008, Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt. And I learned very quickly that that certainty that I had been, uh, that I thought was there really wasn't. 
And I also learned that while it was a terrible experience to go through for, for many people, including myself, I was fine. And so I think that those two lessons when I was at business school really opened my eyes to what is risk and what, you know, what and what is safe. Uh, and so I started taking entrepreneurship classes and I started Gift Simple uh, while in business school. And it didn't really feel risky at the time, um, or at least any riskier than anything else. And I think that that was a, was a great learning from what was a somewhat terrible time period. Um, and, and I think that, you know, similarly, when Gift Simple failed, um, that also terrible, terrible thing to go through. But that was a an experience that unlocked sort of the next experience at DoorDash. And so when I when I asked Tony uh, recently why why he hired me, uh, we were doing an uh, an AMA uh, with my team at our recent offsite, and it was one of the questions I asked him. And you know, for him, he said that that seeing that I had started a company, even though I was at the time closing and shutting down that company, that was interesting to him. He saw that I was someone who was willing to take a risk, was willing to build something from scratch and do whatever was necessary to start a business. And when he was looking for a GM, that's exactly what he wanted. Sure, I had you know investment banking experience and an MBA, but that wasn't what caught his eye. Um, if anything, that probably was the opposite of catching his eye, not at all interesting to him. But the, the fact that I did that and then started a company, that was interesting. And so the fact that I had this failed startup in Gift Simple was what ultimately opened the door to join DoorDash as, as a GM and then ultimately lead to the founding of an analytics organization. Yeah, wow, Jessica, what a story of um, turning failures into learning experiences and opportunities. I think that's great. And and also that you you came from a traditional investment banking where maybe failures are not so tolerated or not so celebrated. So is this something, do you think, startup culture or digital natives are much more used to saying failure is a good thing as long as you convert it to an opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I think that it just generally in society, I think we're starting to talk more about failures. I think, you know, when you tell your your life story, it's really easy to gloss over the failures and talk about how they're opportunities. And it it sounds a lot um, it sounds a lot more planned and maybe uh, less painful than it is when you're going through it. And I think it's it's important to realize that everybody fails in life. There is nobody that succeeds at everything they do. It's probably just a matter of one, are they talking about it? Two, how are they framing it? It's really easy to rewrite history and, yeah. and reframe things uh, uh, differently than they really happen. But I think ultimately you know, for people to know that everybody fails and it's you know, how quickly can you fail? So do you fail and then dwell on that failure and really let it derail you for an extended period of time? Or do you recognize the failure and then make changes? I think it's that response to failure, the actions you take, the opportunities that you allow yourself to, to, to take advantage of, like that is ultimately the more important part not the failure so much itself. Yeah. And the other thing, given that you mentioned uh, 2008, Lehman Brothers, that whole beginning of really our, our last recession, uh, we are not yet in a recession, but um, it seems like some indications say we, we might be headed in that direction. And I think about the role that data played then and now. Um, what's your perspective on the difference of organizations that are already using data and using it well versus those who are still figuring things out to navigate this economic turbulence? I mean, I think someone, I don't know who said this, but someone very smart said, growth hides all sins. And I think when things are going really well, um, it's re it's easier for businesses, for, for just in general, for, for things to continue going up and to the right. 
uh, when the markets change, when the economy is more difficult, when there are challenges to be overcome, I think that's when you start to see teams that where execution matters most. And I think for DoorDash, you know, while I would love for the economy to be rosy and wonderful always in perpetuity, that's not realistic. And so we really need to make sure that we understand the different levers of our business and how to adjust our decisions based on what's in front of us and what's coming down the road and really having a strong sense, not just of those business levers, but of how well we're executing. And if we can continue to use data execute well, then I think that it's during the difficult market conditions when you really start to see the, when sort of the, the top performers really um, extend their lead, right? Really start to shine. And, and the people who aren't doing those things fall behind. Uh, and so, you know, I would say that for us, it's just about continuing to execute the way that we have been, continuing to move forward with our strategy, our data informed strategy, uh, and just uh, keep doing what we're doing. And I think that ultimately that's the, the road to success, no matter the, the market conditions. Yeah, I, so I agree with you and there's research out there even before, um, whether it's during the pandemic, Accenture, for example, said those who were already leading actually increased the gap two to three times the revenue growth versus laggards. And in the last month, there's been some um, different executive roundtables saying the one area that businesses are not scaling back on cybersecurity, of course, but then also AI and analytics investments, because it's almost like you have to keep up to even stay in the game in this digital economy. So that's great for people like us or our listeners um, mm -hmm. that it, it's a good economy. Um, but it for sure means our teams are so, so busy. So if we do a little bit of a hard pivot, when you're not working on data and analytics, what what do you do for fun? More fun than this. <laughs> well, so I mean, so I've got my my like honest answer and then my also honest answer, but my second answer. So my honest answer is sleep. It sounds ridiculous, but my favorite hobby is sleep and I get teased about it constantly, but I think it's just sleep is so important and I can't speak highly enough about it. So if I have free time, I generally will optimize for maximum sleep. But um, but I also love playing tennis. So it's really important for me to get outside and like move uh, instead of spending all day at, at a desk and in meetings. And so whether it's uh, playing tennis at night or on the weekends or just taking a call and walking around the neighborhood while on a call. I just try and do something active and 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 uh, move my body a bit. Yeah, no, that's great. And sleep, you know, I almost sometimes think that there's a bravado about, oh, I only needed four or five hours sleep last night. <laughs> um, I, I am an eight and eight and a half or nine is even better. <laughs> Mm hmm. But I, I agree. I like in banking, we used to brag about our all nighters. It was like a badge of honor, how many all nighters you had and that you pulled one last night and you're still going at 3 p.m. the next day. And I, it, I think I'm hoping things change. And now it's like I got nine hours of sleep and that becomes the, the thing you brag yes. about. But um, but no, I mean, I, I agree with you. I don't I. It's great for people who can actually operate on four hours of sleep. I am not one of those people. No, and if you, <laughs> if you read Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, uh, he would change your mind about that four hour sleep thing. So um, I wouldn't call it a hobby. I would call it a competitive differentiator. How about if we phrase it that way? I like that, I like that. <laughs> and Jess, what about a song that pumps you up after a bad day? So what a song that no matter when it comes on, it takes me back to my, well, my childhood, but also just gets me completely amped would be Enter Sandman by Metallica. 
because that was the song that Mariano Rivera, who is the uh, greatest closer of all times for the New York Yankees, would walk into a game to close out the game and ensure a win. And it's just, I hear that entrance music and I immediately am like ready to go um, for whatever is whatever's in front of me. So okay. love that song, will always love that song. Great, sounds like you're a Yankees fan too. Yes. Big Yankee fan. Okay. Well, I'm from the Northeast, the New Jersey area, but um, I confess we're an Astros fan, having spent time in Houston. So, um, but I we we swapped. You've got yes. you've got the New York or the the Northeast background with a Texas team. I live in Texas, but I'm originally born and raised in New York, so a diehard Yankee fan. Okay, good. And then given our space is moving so quickly and yet you are breaking new grounds, how do you keep up? Um, is it reading? Is it podcasting? Um, is it just talking to others in your industry? Yeah, so I... I think most of the reading that I do is not work related. I try and save reading for kind of enjoyment, for pleasure, for distracting my brain. I would say where I learn the most is talking to others, both within the industry as well as other people that I've hired onto my team who have very different backgrounds from what I do. I don't have a traditional data science or statistics background. I'm not uh, an engineer by training. I have more of a business background. And so for me, the more I can learn from the experts that I'm hiring, people who have PhDs in math and physics and statistics, um, people who have engineering backgrounds, I love learning from them. We do a lot of review of methodologies and documentation within the team. And my team will tell you, I'm in all of those docs, just trying to collect as much information as I possibly can about areas that I'm less knowledgeable. And I think that that comes both in terms of, you know, some of the technical skills um, that, you know, we have experts on the team, but also when it comes to how teams are structured at other companies. So looking at companies that have scaled already Google, Facebook or Meta, right? So looking at how they've built analytics organizations, what I think they've done well, what I think they've, they maybe haven't done as well, and learning from people who have come from those organizations and their perspective and taking the best of all of that um, so that we can create the best analytics organization at DoorDash for DoorDash. Yeah, and I, I think that's also, um when I think of the group that you're comparing to, yeah, it's much bigger um, currently. So it gives us an idea of your aspirations for the team at um, DoorDash. I think also I've seen that you've also opened new engineering centers. You're in Austin. Some of the team is the Bay Area. Does this get back to the whole hybrid work or work from anywhere model? Yeah, so we've hired people around the around the globe, actually, within the analytics team. Uh, we tend to hire people in our hubs around around the world, around, and mostly still in the U.S. Um, as well as Canada and uh, Australia, Germany, and Japan. I think the. What we're trying to do is create an environment where people can see one another face to face. So we've got these um, office hubs in different geographies so that people can meet, they can socialize, they can get the benefit of in-person work while still maintaining the flexibility that so many want, being able to work from home a certain number of days a week. And so we do have this hybrid, hybrid model, although our team has been hiring into hubs for several years now. Um, so while we don't hire sort of everywhere, we do have about 11 cities in the US plus uh, about five internationally where we are hiring analytics team members. Okay, great. And you mentioned that you read more for leisure. So as an avid reader myself, I have to ask, what are you reading or who's your favorite author? So I just finished a book that I really enjoyed. It was called um, The Rose Code 
I don't remember who wrote it, but it's historical fiction about female code breakers at Bletchley Park during World War II. Uh, and it was really, it was just a really great read. Um, and I finished that recently and just started uh, the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. So I don't know if I'm gonna like it yet, just started about like 30 pages in, but those are those are the current books on, um, actually on my library app. I'm a big user of public libraries. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we. I don't read on the app though, but I do, but we physically go to the library and bring print books home, so. <laughs> um, that's nice. Yeah, that's quite a, a range of, of books. Um, I, Jess, it's been such a pleasure having you on the Data Chief podcast. You know, as I think about all the craziness in our world right now, what is something in the last year, let's say, that has just totally made you laugh out loud, maybe tears running down your cheeks? Well, I, I don't know if it gave me tears, but the last thing that made me laugh was actually, um, we. I mentioned earlier that we recently had a team offsite in uh, in San Francisco for my entire team to fly in to get to, to meet one another, some people for the first time ever. Uh, and after three days of activities, learning and development sessions, social activities, I was exhausted. Uh, and there's a uh, someone took a photo of me just like reclining on a chair, just at total exhaustion, um, and then created a meme. So uh, my team created a meme, and then we had a caption this kind of competition in our team Slack channel. And uh, it was the, around the theme of my last name being Lax and Relax. There were some really good puns, and that definitely made me laugh out loud because I, I, I love that my team like is trying to have fun, make yeah. fun of me all in good humor. Uh, and it was really funny because I had never been a meme before. Ah, so well, now that was very exciting for me. I'm sure all the listeners are going to be hoping you're going to sh share that actual meme on social media or on the podcast page. Um, maybe we can convince you to do that. <laughs> Uh, I'll have to run that by our comms team. They might not like that so much, but um, but it's definitely it was definitely pretty funny. Well, maybe maybe if they decline it, um, our design team recently made some fun little miss memes. You called yourself a data nerd earlier. Um, I like data queen or data diva, but they have a data fluent queen uh, little miss meme that um, maybe we can use that instead. Definitely, definitely speaks to me. I like it. Good. Jessica, thank you so much for being on The Data Chief. And of course, thank you to DoorDash for delivering all our favorite foods, whether it's French fries, pizzas, or mine dessert. 